Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Um, uh, today we're talking about the colonial legacies of gender and sexuality in world heritage today. Um, in this webinar, we have lined up for you three great speakers from around the world, um, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, they'll be giving us presentations on the colonial legacies of gender and sexuality um, that are perpetuated um, in cultural heritage institutions, spaces and dialogues. Um, from this, they'll speak to the kinds of actions, epistemologies or approaches uh, which may be used to disrupt heteronormativity when we engage with cultural heritage or heritage research. Um, following the three presentations, uh, we will break for a video um, and you as the audience will get a chance to ask um, our presenters questions in the Q&A box below, uh, which will be in about an hour from now. Um, so why this topic? Um, we can't speak to the nature of this world and power today without um, an acknowledgement of our shared colonial histories, um, the way the world is gendered, the way that sexual and gender diversities are policed or represented uh, is influenced by these colonial histories. Um, so many questions arise from this. Uh, whose vision of gender equality and queerness counts in heritage and who is being erased? Uh, is there a danger of tokenizing or overburdening the role of women in the pursuit of world heritage? Um, how do we queer heritage on a transnational scale when gender and sexual um, identities and the terms around these are so culturally specific? Um, given this week we've had International Women's Day, I think it's a very pertinent time to um, unpack these questions. Um, so this webinar is the second in a series of webinars on diversities and genders as part of our world heritage um, and its 2021 debates. Um, this theme seeks to highlight um, exclusionary processes at play at world heritage sites, as well as to highlight um, new and innovative approaches um, to address them. We'll provide details on the other webinars at the end of this session. Um, to get involved in the conversation, uh, use the hashtags and the links on your screen. Uh, social media accounts in other languages, including Spanish, Arabic, French and Hindi are also available, so do ask us in the chat for these links. Um, also, you'll see in the chat um, information about closed captioning, so please do follow that. Um, I'll now go through all three speakers' biographies before they uh, present. Okay, so firstly, we'll have uh, Dr. Laura Rodriguez Castro, um, who is a researcher, writer and educator interested in decolonial, anti-racist and feminist approaches to difficult memories and heritage. She has just started a postdoctoral research fellowship at the Alfred Deakin Institute of Citizenship and Globalization. Laura's book with Palgrave entitled Decolonial Feminisms, Power and Place, Senti Pensando with Rural Women in Colombia, explores how rural women um, enact and engage um, in, and imagine, sorry, decolonial feminist worlds. Uh, secondly, we have Deepak Srinivasan, um, who is a Bangalore-based artist, media practitioner and design educator with 15 years of practice in performing arts, radio, performing arts, radio, film, community media, design and pedagogy that converge as transdisciplinary practice. Um, his interests include gender, ecology, creative education design, urban space design, knowledge system practices, uh, with a focus on modernity and its intersections with historic process and histories and collective memory. Uh, Deepak's formal work experience spans media content design with urban arts and public sphere centric institutions, social sector collaborators, um, academic curriculum design and design consultancies. And then thirdly, uh, and finally, we'll have Nicole Mulhausen, who is a researcher at Venice Car Foscari University in Italy. She also works as a freelancer on accessibility, interpretation and audience engagement with cultural institutions. 
In 2019, she was awarded a grant to undertake research at the Ilya LGBT Heritage in Amsterdam and currently works on heritage activism and gender, sexual relation and relationship diversities. She is a prospective PhD student at the University of Leicester's Research Centre for Museums and Galleries and board member of the International Committee for Fine Arts, Museums and Collections. Okay, so that's enough talking from me. Um, please do let us know in the chat if you um, have any issues with the closed captioning or anything like that. Um, and then I'd like to invite uh, Laura to present. All right, so thanks uh, for having me. So I want to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the tradition, traditional custodians on the land on which I am speaking from today in Melbourne, Australia. I recognize and pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all First Nations people in the webinar today. So as we talk about ideas about the impacts of coloniality today, let's acknowledge and respect the, respect the struggles of First Nations peoples, their sovereignty, which has never been ceded, and the knowledge embedded within the Aboriginal custodianship of country in so-called Australia. So I'm speaking to you from Australia. So in this presentation, I want to address the question about colonial legacies perpetuated in cultural heritage institutions and processes through narrating some of the complexities of memory work in the most recent Colombian peace process. My aims are to narrate how heritage and the use of memory as social and cultural processes are politically disputed and negotiated and advance agenda, an agenda for decolonial feminist praxis as needed to understand these processes. So I finished the presentation narrating how resistance is enacted through social leaders' actions for place-based, collective, plural, empathetic memory, heritage, and peace making. So in this presentation, I particularly uh, want to travel state-led constructions of historical memory in Colombia. And this is based in 12 in-depth interviews with women social leaders and human rights defenders uh, conducted between November 2019 and January 2020. So all of the participants in these interviews had been involved in previous dialogues in early 2016. And these uh, interviews were embedded in a larger project uh, where I also visited and interviewed key stakeholders in museums, centers, and institutions of historical memory in major cities in Colombia, such as Cali, Medellin, and Bogota. And I particularly focus on the context of Ivan Duque's current right-wing government elected in 2018. So my research purposefully attends to the issue of the ongoing privileging of the global north and an urban white mestizo culture in Latin America by focusing on the epistemic forces of place of campesinas, indigenous and black women in Colombia. As you can see from this table of participants in the slide, there is a privileging of the testimonies of women who represent important organizations in Colombia, such as the Peasant Reserve Zones Association and the Black Communities Process in Colombia. So I'm going to give you a brief context of the politics of memory in Colombia in the context of the peace process. On November 29 and 30 of 2016, the Colombian government ratified a historical peace accord with the left wing guerrilla group, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia People's Army. I'll refer to this as the FARC from here on. According to the Unidad de Victimas in 2019, this long lasting armed conflict has left more than 8 million officially, officially recognized victims. Colombia's post accord period has been tied to a quest to understand what happened during more than 50 years of armed conflict involving paramilitary, military, state, business, and guerrilla actors. In the accord, there is a focus on truth, justice, and reparation for all victims and survivors. The National Center for Historical Memory, which you'll see the acronym as CNMH, and I will refer to as the National Center from here on, was a central institution in the plural processes for historical memory up until the current right-wing government appointed Ruben Darío Acevedo as its director in 2019. Acevedo has been publicly critical of the peace accord with the FARC, 
Alarmingly, he has also publicly denied the, that the internal armed conflict existed in Colombia, noting that what happened was a terrorist threat and an attack to the state. Following the lack of action in the recognition of the armed conflict by the newly appointed center director in February 2020, the Center for Memory was expulsed um, from the international coalition uh, of sites of conscience. Uh, and 84 organizations and 32 social leaders released a statement to withdraw their information from the center's database, expressing their collective determination to stop any collaborations with the institution under Acevedo's direction. So historical memory in the context of Colombia, of the Colombian peace process with the FARC has been characterized by the politicization of peace, memory and heritage, and has even be been called a battle for memory. In this context, denialist politics supported by a right-wing political project of the current government to impose an official truth, have exempted the state for any implication in the violence of the armed conflict and allowed for the historical and symbolic blame of the FARC as the only perpetrator. Estrada Alvarez argues that the dispute for historical truth has become one of the driving causes of the worsening of the peace accord implementation. And this lack of uh, the lack of compliance of the current peace accord has had violent consequences for social leaders and demobilized FARC members. Since they won of the accord, more than 400 leaders have been massacred and over 200 ex-FARC combatants have been murdered. Therefore, the basic warranties for the respect for life and a plural process for discussion about historical memory have not occurred. So the current battle for memory in Colombia is embedded in a broader context of political violence and ongoing social conflict and coloniality that needs to be addressed. So it is in this context of ongoing uh, conflict, violence and coloniality where I want to pose an agenda for decolonial feminist praxis to understand heritage processes in place. Following the work of decolonial anti-racist and communitarian feminists working from Latin America, this praxis, not as concrete theory or school of thought, seeks to strategically undermine the ways in which women's bodies in, and women in the developing world have been respectively constructed as objects and as victims who need saving. So by entangling the interventions of social leaders, I attempt to destabilize the tendency of the coloniality and, uh, of power and gender to deny that women in Colombia are active and central subjects in these debates and that and the heteronormative history of the politics of heritage. So quoting Gloria Ansaldúa from the borderlands, black indigenous campesina women social leaders in Colombia use their own epistemic standpoints and political actions to subvert the militaristic neoliberal and colonial discourses of heritage and memory that are violently, violently denying the victims of the armed conflict their rights for truth and justice in the post-accord period. In conversation with Latin American decoloniality, I argue that the current management of the state-led historical memory in Colombia is embedded in a colonial project that persists. The coloniality of power and gender is therefore lived and felt through processes of epistemic extractivism of memory and knowledge and through the instrumentalization of historical memory. Grossvogel explains that epistemic, economic and ontological extractivism share a process of objectification in which there is a transformation of knowledges of the forms of human and non-human living and of what exists in our surroundings as objects to in instrumentalize. So the consequences of these processes of extraction and exploitation are deeply effective and felt in place and the victim, for the victims and survivors of the ongoing armed and social conflict in Colombia. So I want to turn here to two main points that the social leader discussed as issues in the current state-led forms of historical memory construction. So first, in the interviews, uh, social leaders expressed a concern with the way that historical memory was being instrumentalized. This included issues surrounding the use of international and national funds to meet tight deadlines without material effects in their communities where painful and difficult memories were being discu discussed or sometimes extracted. For instance, uh, feminist activist Diana Kiwa 
who has been involved in various organizing processes, particularly around ethnic and gender rights in Colombia, including the Ruta Pacifica de las Mujeres, argued. So I think that has been one of the biggest critiques to the ways in which the National Center has given account of the acts of violence against women, because, it's, it, because it was devoted to extract, 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 but nothing was left for the women th themselves. Nothing is left. Elda Martinez um, from the Ansark uh, noted, they have forces to generate flash historical memory processes. I mean, of historical memory of one or two days and to not really recapitulate that, his, uh, that history. I think it leads us to play the same games and allow um, many things. So you can see other testimonies here in, in this slide. Regarding the objectification and institutionalization and instrumentalization of memories in heritage and historical memories processes in Colombia, human rights defender and Afro-Colombian leader from the process of com uh, Black communities, Charomina Rojas, illustrated the issues at play here. She said, the issue is that all of this matter of historical memory has become like what I was saying before about women's matters, like a cosa muy utilizada very institutionalized. So they grab things and adapt them and accommodate them, but ultimately the memory needs to contribute to transform. But the way that it has been happening is not really transforming anything because it is a memory that is left in an Achilles and not in dynamic processes of construction and transformation of realities. So the second issue that was mentioned during the interviews related to, the, to security concerns when sharing memories of the armed conflict in historical memory initiatives in a context of ongoing violence, uh, social and armed conflict in Colombia. For example, Mina, Mirna Rosa Herrera, a leader of the Red de Mujeres Matan by Guasa, a black women's network representing those living our, um, along the lowlands of the Caucan Pacific, a region where violence, illegal mining, drug trafficking, and government abandonment continue in the post-accord period, explained that when external organizations have asked them to contribute with their stories to historical memory projects, they have opted for reasserting their autonomy and conducting their own processes slowly and carefully for their safety. And she's, this here she explained why. why. If other people enter the territory to ask questions, people are not going to give them the information like it is. First, because we know that the conflict is not gone. So we don't know about the consequences that giving this information might bring. Do you know what I mean? So various social leaders in the interviews also narrated experiences of feeling unsafe, and some of them expressed doubt on whether in a time of ongoing targeted violence at social leaders, instrumentalist and time-limited processes for historical memory were appropriate. So among this Concerning context of a state-led historical memory construction and ongoing violence and conflict, there is also a growing number of initiatives and processes for place-based collective memory in Colombia. As I have argued in other work, social leaders and organizations in Colombia were deeply aware of the issues that the post-accord period was going to bring with a right-wing government. State-led colonial violence is an experience that peasant, Black, Indigenous people have faced in Colombia for decades. At the same time, people have continued to resist from the territory in place, from the body land and from a political commitment to the construction of peace in Colombia. So here are some excerpts from the interviews that point to the importance of these initiatives. For example, agrarian and environmentalist rights defender Elilia Mendoza articulated how she imagined plural and democratic collective memory processes. She said, this is an exercise that needs to happen from the heart and the soul of the organizations. So it needs to be constructed and written, every action, every caminar. No one knows that they will be part of history in a determined moment that depends on the sum of all these diversities and the sum of all the differences. But it's also the sum of all the histories that this country has, the important historical wealth. 
Regarding the processes of for place-based collective memory, there was a major argument regarding the need to center feminist and or woman-centered processes for historical memory, given the gendered and intersectional violences that women in the Colombian conflict have experienced. Referring to the work of grassroots feminist women's organizations in Colombia, Diana Kigua noted, the process of a historical memory proposed from one's organizations with their methodologies implicitly is accompanied by processes of transformation of women's subjectivities, which is very different from the way that history is being narrated from the National Center. So she, she continued saying, so women rise in another way, like with incredible tools and potentiality. So let's say that this is the bed for non-hegemonic historical memory. So as you read more of these quotes, these claims point to the importance of dignifying women's memories in place and for heritage and memory processes that seek embodied transformations. Together, these interventions reveal the importance of differential approaches to historical and collective memory that take into account ethnicized, racialized, and other intersectional experiences. From non-hegemonic, place-based, and territorial use of memory, women leading collective organizing in Colombia are proposing and enacting plural forms of peace and heritage. And in this way, communities are asserting control over national and international histories of the Colombian armed conflict, while continuing to resist in place various forms of violence and coloniality. So engaging with the colonial scholarship and praxis, and praxis to understand the Colombian peace process and its politics of memory provide an important opportunity to address heritage and memory processes that focus on expo exposing how colonial privilege and power operates. In turn, this can destabilize the tendency of normative world heritage to center heteronormative, colonial, linear, and abstract forms of authorized heritage. Hopefully in this presentation, I have illustrated why there is a need to center gender decolonial or post-colonial anti-racist, Southern or subaltern uses of memory and heritage. A fe feminist decolonial praxis advances the conversation on coloniality that is needed in the context of world heritage. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lara. That was excellent. Um, that just touches on absolutely everything I'd hope to for this uh, session, that it um, encaptures ideas of the way that unfortunately so many women are put in this place of, as you've said, um, extractivism of knowledge and the instrumentalization of um, historical memory and the way that women aren't given that respectful kind of participation in these processes. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to invite Deepak to present for um, his talk now. That's all right. Uh, hello here from Bangalore, uh, India. And uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, to this panel. My uh, presentation has been titled Decolonizing Experiences of Gender, <clears throat> and I've tried to make it a little more image centric uh, and narrative centric rather than uh, be more heavy on research, uh, presenting the research. Uh, but I will share the research in terms of uh, through kind of narrative storytelling. <clears throat> Just as a context for artistic practice-based research, my practice is a convergence of disciplines and experiences with core inquiries in art, design, and media. And my work began with exploring the potential of theater tools and performance to create spaces for public dialogue. I had to connect performance, cultural histories, and early media histories to understand psychosocial and psychocultural processes as an artist. Uh, things that shape public identities like gender, <clears throat> caste, class, and so on. So uh, my inquiries in the public sphere centered around bodies and how they occupy public space, courtship rituals, um, and also the kind of violence that takes place on both women and LGBTQ communities in the so-called modern period. <clears throat> Um, my practice has located itself on cultural interfaces that negotiate tradition and modernity broadly and 
as my work with the public domain has developed, it has come to focus on remembering colonial histories of art and performance that have been erased from public memory, exploring traditional within quotes, Indian mythological narratives and their modern, again, within quotes, uh, storytelling. Uh, and the third being reconnecting to movements, which I would call spiritual, uh, in, but they were actually social consciousness movements that prompted ethical proto-feminist proto pro-earth ideas, <clears throat> also sowing seeds of egalitarian thinking much before the Indian freedom movement. I won't elaborate on all of these uh, because of time, but I will illust illustrate point one to show how the storytelling around these kinds of research unravels for me. But I want to start the discussion uh, with an example of a recent social media conversation on the portrayal of intimate scenes, namely kissing scenes and their censorship history in Indian cinema. The discussion was triggered by comments of two American YouTubers who review uh, Bollywood cinema regularly. And of course, reacting to Indian pop culture videos is the new business venture out there. Uh, it's quite a successful one. So the, these uh, YouTubers commented on film scenes which show heavy necking by protagonists of uh, the 80s and 90s in Bollywood songs. Such scenes have been cinematic devices to allude to real intimacy which are, without shooting nudity or kissing sequences. Indians usually react with comments which are apologetic or defensive, but many assuming that conservatism on screen was always a part of Indian cinematic language and that progress towards showing French kissing mostly extensively seen on screen without censorship only in the past 15 years or so is due to the recent liberalization of the censorship board. <clears throat> the truth though is that the silent cinema era which lasted from early 1900s to 1930s saw what can be described uh, to use Indian terms as bold actors who didn't shy away from portraying realism when it came to intimacy on screen. Uh, so this image is uh, still from the film A Throw of Dice from 1920s and it's uh, set around a mythological narrative. The lead actress was Sita Devi. Um, and this was way back in the 1920s. The advent of the talkies era also, which happened uh, maybe mid thirties, that also didn't deter actors um, to portray kissing on screen. So in 1940s as well, we see uh, this is Devika Rani who's, who plays the lead actor, actress, and Himanshu Rai sharing a moment. The subsequent post-colonial conservatism that we are familiar with today has its roots in the installation of a censor board <clears throat> by the British in, in 1918. And it has paved the path to image and narrative censorship in media policies and cinema culture. Colonial attitudes and policies have had a number of repercussions on a, on a whole lot of institutions and cultural knowledge systems as they were targeted by colonizers to socially and culturally ostracize expression for women and non-gender conforming groups, also certain castes and tribes and in the process also affecting subsequent media histories. One such influence in my work has been the story of colonial processes and the kotha. The kotha loosely translates to brothel in modern lingo, but it actually is a sort of a pro Habermasian public sphere, public space. Um, <clears throat> Kotas were actually residences and dance, uh, residences and dance and music houses of 19th century North Indian courtesans who were known as Tawaif. So scholar Veena Talwar Oldenburg in her work, Lifestyles of Resistance, writes about the Tawaif living, many of whom came from Muslim uh, backgrounds as well, around whom the institution of the Kota existed. So she writes that these women were perceived themselves as open courts, as powerful, independent, and subversive women, close courts. Uh, sort of a counterculture to patriarchy in terms of intellectuality, also financially and politically, but using aesthetic means. <clears throat> so there is a lot of photo documentation because a lot of the women did pose for, uh, for a number of photographers. They were also the first ones to also record 
uh, um, and uh, go public with their works. But unfortunately, a lot of these images, we don't know who they are. We don't know their names. So this is from 1870, Lavatha wife. This is Malka Jan from Lucknow, who we know. Um, it's a little more uh, in, into the 20th century. Derided as notch curls, a term derived from the Hindustani Urdu term notch, meaning dance. Courtesans were criminalized by the British through the anti notch curl campaign extensively from 1892 to 1910. <clears throat> uh, and the colonizers uh, who were influenced by Victorian morality dubbed this public culture as debauchery. Such views soon spread to other courtesan cultures in the east and south of the subcontinent and the Devadasi or temple dancers who were also similarly disenfranchised and brand branded as common prostitutes. This is not to say that it was a glorious era for, for women in terms of art and their right to life and sexual autonomy. It was far from it, but there was much uh, also caste-based influence and on gender and a woman's autonomy. Include, including cultural and social coercion uh, to becoming Devadasis. Yet, <clears throat> this moment seems to allude to a loss of public eros and a South Asian woman's loss of agency over her own life decisions and financial and intellectual autonomy as well. Curiously, the post-independence Indian state has taken many of these dance forms like Kathak, Sabiratam, which has been renamed as Bharatanatyam, ODC and branded them as cultural dance heritage. And this has also happened with classical music without any form of tribute to the backgrounds and histories of these artists who developed these forms for centuries. Despite 73 years of Indian independence, very few contemporary performers as well have been aware or interested to speak about these traditional communities and the histories. And many upper caste groups have co-opted the forms of art, music and dance practice celebrating soul rights over them. And this ownership narrative of theirs is the newly constituted post-colonial historiography for these forms. A related post-colonial shame moment that led to cultural reforms, mostly led again by upper caste groups has been the cleaner pact of mythological narratives of South Asian gods, beliefs and practices, which I won't fully have time to elaborate or illustrate today, but I have been interested in the alternate oral cultures and caste-based memories through rituals and art practice, which have been crudely clumped together as folk, uh, because they still hold narratives of gods and perform and tell stories of their gender dimorphism and sexual fluidity. <clears throat> so here's a, a popular god Shiva, um, depicted with a folk art form uh, from the West. No Rajasthani, uh, it's androgynous. The left and right half of the body are half male, half female. This is a form of, of the male god and how he's depicted at times. This is the same idea, maybe represented in the East or Central, Central East India. You can see the forms and the colors and the body types are different. And here you have a third form, which is a more colonial form. This is Raja Ravi Varma work. Uh, and he was also heavily influenced by um, Renaissance art. So you can see that kind of making its way into the body and being more anthropocentric in terms of its depictions. Uh, but this is a talk for another day, uh, a little bit of art history here. Um, so in this context, I will briefly present my conceptual collaboration and performance in a photo project titled Aravanis, which is from 2014, which was led by Bangalore-based photographer and friend Chinar Shah. The theme is inspired by the performance of an annual ritual based on a mythological telling of how a prominent male god took the form of a wife and lover to the soldier warrior character named Aravan. Aravan's tale is told in Tamil Nadu and they say that he was the son of a prominent protagonist, Arjuna, from the Indian epic Mahabharata. Tamil Nadu-based folk performance and rituals mark the story of unusual union between this warrior and his male androgynous wife, 
and its subsequent tragedy by performing an annual site-specific ritual in Kuwagam, which is a Tamil town. This ritual allows local transgender women to claim a cultural inheritance and line lineage to their androgynous deity, and the narrative legitimizes their socialization. So this is an image that was uh, created uh, to visualize this mythological story between Aravan, who you see here in yellow, wearing yellow and seated, and uh, Krishna or Mohini, the androgynous god, and their courtship. Um, and just to refer to this image, Mohini is usually shown as a fully transfigured woman, uh, but being of essence of a male god. And we brought this idea together in our works and uh, we recreated these more contemporary images of what it would be to be this deity who takes on the form of a, uh, takes on a feminine form. Our works, which are a modern interpretation of images, have not been shown or seen in the contemporary visualization in a completely public and modern setup due to the present day climate of severe cultural conservatism and intolerance in our region. And this is where I'll stop my presentation and can elaborate a bit more about the ritual and gender dimorphism, as well as narrative in the discussion if anyone would be interested. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak, for that. That's so deeply interesting. And yeah, I really hope we can get into more discussion about that later because yeah, that's just so fascinating and to learn about how this erasure of, of counterculture and then, but also the erasure of mythologies and this cultural heritage that you have. Um, yeah, really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to invite Nicole to present now. Hi, yes. So hi everyone and thank you very much for uh, having me. It's really an honor to be able to be here and contribute to this interesting discussion. And the question that I would like to address with uh, this presentation is how can museums and heritage spaces have a role in disrupting heteronormativity, especially through interpretation? And the observations and the case studies that I will present are based on a research that has been uh, supported by ELI LGBT Heritage, an international archive and library on gender and sexual diversities based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And to begin, I would like to review a selection of examples that have worked on these issues, primarily from the UK and Europe. Whereas after, I would like to consider the theoretical implication behind the projects. So let's start by taking a look at this brochure, which has been developed by the British Museum some, some time ago. And it reframes some of 15 objects of the collections, which are on permanent display in the museum, located in different galleries from an LGBT and queer perspective and a trail that has been called Desire, Love and Identity. The short stories that are presented span across cultures and times, conveying a powerful message, I think. That is to say that non-binary gender identities and non heteronormative views of relationships and sexualities have always been existed and celebrated in different ways in different world cultures. However, when it comes to analyzing interpretation, I think it's always interesting to interrogate what type of knowledge is presented and ask the question, who is speaking here? And although the museum, the British Museum, has moved towards what we can call for now an inclusive uh, approach in, into brackets, perhaps, uh, it still perpetuates an expert point of view as the labels and the interpretation has been provided by the staff and the curators who works inside the museum. So it's a tradition, still a traditional mode of interpreting material culture within museums. So let's now look at the case of the Kingston Lacey to uh, consider this critical point further. During a temporary exhibition, which has been developed in collaboration with uh, the Research Center for Museums and Galleries at the University of Leicester in the UK, and which marked the 50th anniversary of the partial democratization of homosexuality in the UK, this property of the National Trust explored the story of William Banks, one of the property's owner, who was prosecuted for indecent acts and exiled. So his stories made visible within the interpretation and the wider framework of LGBT struggles for equality, 
But furthermore, the, the interpretation integrates stories from contemporary LGBT people who reflect on the idea of being displaced. So we can see how people's knowledge and memories have been integrated within the layout and they disrupt these divisions which are between knowledge types that can often be found in museums and heritage sites, making both type of knowledge visible and accessible. And I think that the point of incorporating people lived experiences is especially important when it comes to interpreting or making space for trans identities, as in fact their experiences are often being told, especially in the media, by third parties reinforcing negative stereotypes. That's why I think it's especially interesting to consider a series of exhibitions that were developed by ILIA between uh, 2019 and 2020, where diverse trans uh, communities, people, artists and authors were invited to self-represent their voices and their experiences within the exhibition space. So again, we, we see how there has been left space for the communities to self-represent their voice within within the institution and Ilya's staff only added content and perspective by exhibiting some related objects from the collection. So um, if we consider, consider these case studies altogether, I think they offer an idea of how museums are learning to use the culture of the past to address and perhaps challenge contemporary stereotypes which relates to assumption about gender and sexuality but also how to integrate different voices and type of knowledge within an exhibition space. And looking backwards in the last decade or so, I think there has been um, a huge emphasis in, in both in the debate and in practices on how museum and heritage spaces can work on concepts which relates to sexuality and gender activism from queer perspective, drawing on the idea that museums are a neutral in the interpretation they provide of heritage, and that they can play activist role within society. And all these actions have been really spanning across uh, different contexts and continents. And in this respect, I think it's especially interesting to, to consider the publication developed by ICOM, which has been released recently, where you can really read about different case studies in different cultural contexts. And if we look at this debate, I think that a shift that has uh, occurred in recent years is that the call for making a queer approach something that is more structural within the museum. So not just a focus on the interpretation of, of the collections, but actually taking the queer theoretical stances which relate to the idea of challenging power structures and make it more uh, holistically embedded within the way the institution think and acts. So an example of an organization that has been moving in this direction, I think, is the Van Abbe Museums in, in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Here, queer artists, communities, and diverse constituencies have continuously been involved in the creation of discourses and projects that challenge ethnonormative structure of knowledge. In the picture, you can see that visitors can look at artworks from queer glossaries, reading labels on each other's clothes, or so dismantling the traditional way of interpreting collections or the trans artists have been involved in residencies that interrogated the very meaning of their presences in their museums. So try to move away from the tokenism that often persists in the way heritage spaces work. And also that the museum has converted some gender binary toilets into gender neutral ones, but also providing interpretation in order to invite the viewer to reflect on the critical implication behind, behind these actions. Nevertheless, it is not the sum of these uh, queer theme projects that make the museum queer, but rather their common underlying theoretical approach, which critically looks at how knowledge is produced and tries to share responsibility in these processes with different constituencies that makes the museum queer. So the idea is, is to have more this epistemological gaze rather than just a focus on projects that are queer themed. And I think that uh, even though if we look at current trends in the museum sector, the colonizing approach and queering approach are increasing, um, a pitfall and a critical aspect to current practices is that this type of projects tend to be often carried out by different departments. So intersectional interdisciplinary thinking is seldom integrated within the museum's internal structure and way, way to work and act. So, 
um, in order to further consider how legacies of gender and sexuality intersect in heritage representation, I will now look at an example that is outside of a museum. So the statue of Indra Montanelli was an Italian journalist who has been internationally recognized for his work, but who also joined the Italian colonial war during the fascist time in Eritrea, during which he bought a 12-year-old Eritrean girl as a sexual slave. At the present time, as in many other contexts throughout um, the world, the debate surrounding this statue is polarized. Those who ask that the statue should be removed and resignify this monument with graffiti, and those who condemn this act as vandalism and believe that removing statues of public figures equals occulting histories and perhaps demand that interpretation should be implemented. But I think that first of all, it should be noted that placing a statue in a square, it's an, at least in Europe, it's an iconic act of celebration that can be evened with the adding of interpretive labels. It, it doesn't have the same symbolic importance that it would have within a museum. But I think that the point here with respect to, to the history behind Montanelli and perhaps other colonial history and legacies of gender and sexuality is that these type of stories are often forgotten in the teaching of history, even in school or like neglected and taken aside in popular knowledge. And I think that that's the space and the responsibility for the museum to act and to make these stories visible and not forgotten as they're not marginal in the process of uh, making meaning of history. And also I think that it would be important for museums to direct their gaze also at what is outside of the museums and the heritage that is in the landscape and not just to always have a focus on, on the collections. Now I would like to um, briefly reflect on the ethical implication behind this type of work as it tends really often to, to be labeled as inclusive, but I think it's also time to start to problematize the label inclusion. In fact, I think it's interesting and appropriate to ask actually who includes who. In fact, even in contexts where queerness is visible in, in the media and in other forms of cultural production, like Italy, for example, still museums, library, archive choose to remain silent about these issues and about the multiple connections that can be found between the heritage they, pre they preserve and these topics. So I think that the point is not really that of including new stories in order to include and better represent new audiences, but the issue is to include museums in a global human rights debate that is already there and that is already ongoing. And why, why is this important? One idea that I really wanted to, to put forward is that in many contexts, although it would be surely important to, to generalize, what we need at the current state is actually a deep and profound cultural transformation in relation to um, what it means to the debate of gender, sexual and relationship diversity. And in that respect, even if the acronym LGBT has become extremely uh, useful and significant, I think it would be perhaps interesting to draw on the concept of gender, sexual and relationship diversity, which tries to frame all human experiences within the umbrella of diversities and also tries to highlight how museums drawing on this concept could really perform a role that it's surely activist in a way, but also deeply educational in trying to to embrace more fluid and concepts of our gender and sexuality and embrace diversity. And then I think it's also important to ask, uh, like for whom, what, what is the aim goal of this type of projects and what type of audiences a uh, museum wishes to, to reflect. And I think that a critical point that we see in current practices is that museums often have like an attitude to um, embrace storytelling, perhaps critically, rather than focusing on listening pro processes. So I think that there is a risk of like this whole debate of improving narrative, which can bring us to mainly consider this type of practices from the vantage point of view of the institution. And I think that to begin, museums should actually uh, try to listen to what the needs are the, of the community they wish to serve. And then based from that, try to relate those needs to the interpretation of the collection and make it relevant towards the needs of audiences and different communities. So um, to conclude, the main message that I really wanted to share is that through the interpretation of material culture of the past, museums can actually address 
uh, current stereotypes which relates to gender and sexuality and whether they draw on if um, queer approaches on colonial approaches, this critical um, thinking about knowledge structure should never be uh, over. So thank you very much uh, for listening and that will be it for now. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, that was brilliant again. And um, I really, really liked the question that you raised of who includes who. I think by framing it that way, it, taught, it really highlights the power dynamic that comes from a lot of inclusion processes. Um, and the term that you've raised about gender, sexual and relationship diversity is really interesting. And it, it's a rejection of the kind of binary thinking around um, LGBT and not LGBT. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, right, so thank you to our speakers. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I hope uh, that's enough time for a break. Um, uh, I, uh, now is like a good time for questions, so please do for um, any of our speakers, so please do feel free to post in the Q&A um, and um, for any questions you may have for any of our speakers. Um, and yeah, so I know that um, one of my colleagues had a question um, for, for Laura, I'll just get it up. Um, um, so how can decolonial feminisms provide a lens to understand heritage and memory in peace processes? Go for it. <laughs> well, I've tried to answer some of this question um, in my presentation. I think um, something that I find quite important in thinking through, through concepts and ideas such as decolonial feminisms rather than being a lens that can be applied um, to any kind of situation or context is more of a political standpoint and that needs to engage with uh, place-based and territorial processes that are quite different. I think that could be um, a quite... A, a, an important starting point and, and standpoint in, in, in understanding heritage and memory in peace processes. Um, but what, what I, I think that the colonial feminism has done uh, in thinking through these processes in my own work in the context of the Colombian Peace Accord is that it's kind of bringing to the, the for the ongoing political actions of women and social leaders as epistemic su subjects who are central to the debates and constructions of a historical memory in the country. So it, it is part of a world, broader conversation about kind of critical heritage and decolonizing projects, but it's also around uh, taking seriously uh, the epistemic forces of place uh, of people who are constructing this in place. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I, I hope that answers um, Mav's question. Um, so um, just waiting on some more questions, but in the meantime, um, I'd like to um, ask Deepak to um, expand a bit on what you were saying in your presentation, um, if that's possible, just particularly about um, uh, the project that you were doing um, about the mythologies and the photography, if you could. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I have spoken of, about this project in a couple of forums and which is why I chose to speak of the other one, which I haven't really uh, had a chance to focus on much. Um, so this particular project that I was referring to is a, a public performance project based on a ritual that again happens in the city of Bangalore. It's a, a community called the Tegilas who take out a procession um, in, uh, in spring. It's a kind of a reclamation of space, but it's also ecological in the sense that it marks, um, marks the space, it marks water bodies, uh, it marks a kind of tribute to the space. So in a way, it's a kind of a and much has been written and documented about this ritual called the Karaga, which is uh, a kind of an annual traditional festival that still happens in the modern landscape. Um, <clears throat> so as a, as a 
a person who grew up in Bangalore and uh, had a relationship with the city. I, I hadn't really known much about this ritual. Uh, and uh, this, this space of Bangalore is also quite unique. The city, uh, it has always been a twin city in some sense, the cantonment being quite co cordoned off from the old city, which, which has much more older roots. So I was quite intrigued by the kind of division or this kind of polarity of tradition uh, with the influence of uh, colonialism um, um, and how space got divided up in that sense and cultures as well. And um, this kind of demarcation of space was also seen in the, in the way people lived their lives, the people felt which part of the city had its, you know, what was the heart of the city. Um, and, and these two cities in, in some sense were twins which never spoke to each other. But now, of course, with capitalism, it's become like a, po a porous city, which has brought all of it together uh, with no real culture. So a lot of people come to Bangalore, ask, what do I see? What is the heritage, heritage of the city? It's a, it's a new city. One assumes that it's, it, it's just a, became a city in the 90s, but it has nearly a 500 year old history of, of sorts. Uh, so this community particularly venerates a goddess uh, and their head priest cross dresses as a woman. Uh, he takes a procession through the city and the goddess is supposed to possess him. And this was in context, uh, this was intriguing for me because within the traditional context, a man dressing up as a woman uh, in, in some sense taking, going through the city was 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 being permitted, so to speak, but women, for example, modernizing, wearing jeans, or you know, kind of taking processions, uh, sorry, uh, occupying public space, would often get uh, kind of. Uh, there was a moment where modernization of that sort was uh, kind of looked down upon, targeted. There was also violence against women. So this masculine masculinization of bodies versus feminization of a man in the traditional context intrigued me, and I started cross-dressing in certain contexts as the goddess and having public conversations with people, both in terms of the mythology of the goddess and her womanhood, as well as uh, uh, the kind of, um, how do you say it? Um, the history of the city, really the landscape of the city. So these elements, uh, the way they intersected in the public conversations, the intimate performance, as I called it, those elements kind of um, helped me uh, get more of an answer and kind of penetrate the ideas of what a city could be, what a city space is, uh, how people perceive the city and how gender in a way operates in the sense of a man dressing up as a woman within the context of tradition uh, and memory, which is fossilized in some sense, but modernity in some, if, if, um, if I were to do it, I would attract a lot of, uh, you know, uh, curiosity, maybe also, uh, a male bodied person would, would have some amount of trepidation to try something out like that in a public space. So this project has led to a number of different kinds of inquiries, both in terms of theater and performance, but also in film. Um, and it has created a lot of conversation in that sense. And, and I call it the Draupadi project because it's centered around Draupadi as a character. So the character becomes both a, both a mythological narrative as well as the uh, story of the city for me. And, and that's the project I would like to share a little bit more about in that context. Right, thank you for that. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, just to elaborate on that is so interesting. Thank you so much. Um, right, so uh, we've got some questions in the Q&A. Um, I think for our speakers, you can read the questions if that helps you answer. I'm just gonna take it from the top down um, and um, it, the first one here I've got from Steve Brown is to Nicole. Um, it says, can you say more about Kingston Lacey, please? Um, how is sexuality and diverse sexualities and identities represented in the long history, in history of the place? How is trans identity integrated into the longer history of the place? Or is it treated as a separate history? So um, thank you very much, Steve, for the question. And firstly, I'd like to say that um, the project that was developed in collaborate through a collaboration that happened between the National Trust and the University of Leicester, there is lots of material that has been published in relationship to content development and the framework behind the project and also audience responses to the exhibition that is all publicly available um, online. So if you want to come up 
to, to refer to that also afterwards. But um, I think that the, the strong concept behind also the use of languages and how identities are presented was to focus on the concept of queerness. In fact, there is um, an essay by Masmit and Richard Saldent who reflected a lot about the language to use. It's called Bringing Queer Home. It's also publicly um, available online, which sort of tries to reflect on queer identities without really um, establishing hierarchies or differences, but rather to use queer as a sort of the most comprehensive term in which to um, refer to different identities. And I think that with respect to trans, trans identities, they would be um, mostly representative between in the space where you have um, people's knowledge and memories being integrated within, within the framework rather than on the whole uh, history. But perhaps I would also like look back at the material that has been published online to, to look backwards. But yeah, the strong concept was to draw on the idea of queer in order to make these more comprehensive stories rather than have like separate, separate identities being displayed in different places. Yeah, I guess that speaks to the gender, sexual, relationship, diversity term as well to, yeah, encapsulate that. Thank you for that answer. Um, another question here we have from Vishna. I hope that's how you pronounce it. Um, it says, thanks for all the moving presentations. Question for Laura. Could you share with us an example of how some of the women groups, collectives or communities in Colombia counteract these institutional extractivisms and displacements of memories and in which ways they tackle memories in their actions and struggles? So how they enact alternate, alternative visions of memory and heritage? That's a great question. <laughs> Yeah, um, definitely. There's so many examples. It's it's um, almost overwhelming the amount of um, collectives and initiatives that have happened in this kind of violent context in which the post accord is uh, is happening in Colombia. Uh, two come to mind. Um, the first one is the amazing work by a uh, human rights defender and social leader called Virgelina Chara. Uh, she was forcibly displaced uh, from Suarez, Cauca, and has been living in Bogota for some time. And she's the leader of the Embroidery Union. Uh, that's part of uh, the Center for um, Memory, not the National Center, but the Center for Memory in Bogota. They all have similar names. And she talks about uh, this idea of the pedagogy of memory. And part of the way that she explains the pedagogy of memory that actually it's changing now the name to the power of memory is um, through a process of kind of um, flipping the roles. And basically what she's done uh, with workshops and with anyone that comes into the space of the embroidery union is ask people to share their own memories that we've all had um, something to do with violence, with conflict, uh, particularly um, in Colombia, rather than just asking her what happened to her. And she's done this in schools. Um, if you go and meet her in the Center for Memory, um, she'll sit down with you and ask you to get um, in the embroidery um, kind of uh, uh, banner that they've been doing for ages. So she's, she's now got international universities involved in, the, in this project. And um, so this has been one of the examples. Another example that um, is quite amazing is the community of peace of San Jose de Apartado. And um, there's many, they've, they've got, have many initiatives there, but one that comes to mind in, in, in terms of thinking um, through this kind of collectives and, co and communities counteracting institutional extractivism is that they walk territories that they weren't able to walk, so their own territory uh, with the community, recognizing places and sites of violence and reclaiming those spaces. And these walks can go for many days. And um, there's been, again, a lot of work um, on, the, on the community of peace of San Jose de Aportado of, of, of place-based territorial processes of collective memory. Thank you for that, Lara. Um, it's really interesting to hear the 
actions being taken um, in opposition to that. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, a second question here we've got for Nicole. It says, um, from Joanne, it says, which ways of listening do you find most effective in the work that you've looked at where museums have been working with communities? Okay, so thank you, Joanne, for the question. And like, I've encountered two approaches that really impressed me and they're like entirely different in the ways they are structured and their goals and their ends. And one was elaborated by Imagine IC, so a Dutch-based institution in collaboration with the Rheinwar Academy and also experimented with other partners. And the, the idea was to sort of run workshops where you have uh, different people that stands, that have perhaps different beliefs in relationship to a certain topic. And then in this workshop, you would have um, the person who leads the workshop asking the question, how do you feel about a certain topic? And then rather than having like people taking sides and just explaining how they feel uh, in relationship to the topic presented. You would have the leader of the workshop revealing information get gradually from different perspectives and sort of try to map through a workshop if and how people experiences like and beliefs shift towards this process of like listening by each other arguments and perhaps shifting um, perspective. And I thought it was an interesting way also to like observe this process. And then in a totally different context, there was um, uh, a museum in London. For, I think it was a part of the university from the UCL and is the Museum of Zoology. And they developed, they wanted to refurbish the whole permanent collection, including uh, people's perspective within the collection but try to challenge the idea that the museum would involve some representative of some community as a way of being really representative. So rather than, than like organizing a focus group where they would have selected people, they integrated digital technologies within the display, asking open questions to like everyone and aiming to have different points uh, of, of view in relationship to like how could the museum take further also the process of like refurbishing the collection and assign new meaning to, to the item. So, so they tried to challenge the idea that in order to listen, you, you necessarily need to set up a focus group inviting representatives of the community, but try to, to make that process also more transparent, more, uh, more visible actually. Thank you for that. Um... That's a really good answer. Um, so uh, another question here, oh actually I should say um, to attendees, yeah, please continue to put um, questions in the Q&A, we still have a little bit of time left. Um, and also um, to fill in the Mentimeter um, uh, link as well uh, for the, set, the, for the um, sort of um, uh, word cloud um, that we're trying to build here. Um, right, so next question uh, we've got from Dr. Toki Brown. Um, can any speakers elaborate more? So this is for everyone. Can any speakers elaborate more? The bias experienced by Eurocentric views deepen the understanding um, of the challenges faced while identifying ways to better incorporate gender heritages, perspectives and ontologies into world heritage. Um, if you can read the question on the Q&A, I think as well to help. Um, anyone, whoever wants to go first, go for it. Maybe I can just go I for it. Can... Oh, go Deepak, go Deepak. No, go, go, go. Sure, okay. Uh, no, I was just kind of thinking about the <clears throat> idea of a, of a museum or, or a space that in a way uh, captures heritage and uh, that the very act of kind of framing um, a narrative or framing a kind of or claiming a certain kind of you know identity of heritage or value through heritage uh, in a way for me that act itself is a kind has come from eurocentric practices of what how you remember and how you should remember and then there is contestation of space and narrative and power within that kind of a, a setup um, and, in, and in my head, I think remembering is done differently in different cultures. So I guess when we speak of heritage, we also need to try and look at ways in which different um, parts of the world have 
have documented or tried to remember. And not everything is through the process of non-fiction documentation uh, through text. A lot of it is also through storytelling, through performance, through uh, you know artistic practice, uh, material culture in different ways. And so those elements need to be brought in in terms of you know to to kind of dismantle the older ways of how a museum can work or or how heritage can be framed. Uh, and I think, so for me as a performer, I kind of see storytelling and the affirmal nature of things. Like I might have a narrative today to claim and I perform it and I tell a story, but if I have it in, in a materiality framed in a certain way, then it becomes much harder for someone else to come and tell a counter story tomorrow. And I don't think any one story ever has, you know, can be the story that dismantles power and takes its place and then and creates a kind of equality there will be a counter story to the story so how do we have places which are more participatory both in terms of cultural kind of exchange but and also but more specifically institutional uh, whether it is state-run museums or even private museums or, or this uh, this kind of act of framing that's something i think we should really rethink in terms of uh, when it comes to heritage per, per se uh, Nicole, did you have a response? Uh, yes, I just wanted to say that the question really like recalls an example I visited uh, last year, the Tropen Museums in Amsterdam, so dedicated to Dutch former colonies, last year mounted an exhibition called What a Genderful World. Uh, so the idea was to sort of have this approach that I briefly talked about in the British Museum, but throughout an exhibition. So like having cultures of the world in order to really show like how different societies in different times have celebrated and tolerated and different um, gender identities that are not binary. And like th the way the exhibition was, was mounted, I used so examples throughout histories, throughout different times, throughout different parts of the world to sort of reinforce this narrative which makes perfectly sense in the Netherlands or in Europe where we are increasingly moving towards this idea of um, hopefully gender being not uh, binary and reframing this discussion from LGBT perspective and the exhibition was really like a claimed in the media and also from my point of view as European researcher and I also really appreciate it but then like I also came across um, strong critiques for the exhibition coming from more anthropological points of view where two authors, I'll post the link of the article if that's interesting, um, where like they were really critiquing how it's really Eurocentric sort of to use culture of the past, for example, like to spirit identities just to reinforce the idea that gender identities weren't binary. Um, but without actually providing context to understand that, that culture. So that was the critique, like the idea of like, just uh, like if like a puzzle, like taking different identities from different parts of the world to reinforce a narrative that makes sense within Europe, but without actually give, adding chances to, to have more meaning about those cultures that are exhibited. So that was the critique and I thought it's, um, it's something really important to, to reflect on also in respect to that example of the British Museum I mentioned before, like how we attach LGBT labels to culture that had nothing to do with the idea of LGBT that has already been discussed in terms of how it can be productive to make sense about this global human rights movement, but at the same time there might be some other implication in terms like uh, if it's what justice do we do to those cultures that are exhibited without much context about about their their wider context actually. Um, did, uh, Laura, did you have a response to the question as well? Yeah, um, I mean, I I just kind of complementing what uh, both of the speakers said that I think was uh, very pertinent. I think there is also here. Um, kind of a, a, a need to start thinking about how the coloniality of power through Eurocentrism is manifesting in world heritage and in heritage institutions before we even get to a point of, of thinking through radical transformations. Because there is um, all of these questions around, again, extractivist memory making in the instrumentalization of memories, particularly um, 
in in Europe and in the global north, and uh, almost and 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 tactics of tokenism as well. And this, I think, it's it, it it's quite important when and 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 how and asking questions about how we destructure Eurocentrism that involve. Um, kind of institutional and structural change, even the way that we think about this idea of world heritage, of universality, of homogeneity, um, and so on. Um, and looking at the consequences that that is having in places, um, the violent consequences that's having in, in places, um, like some of us have um, talked about in the different presentations. Right, thank you for that. Um, I'll just to say that, um, so we're at 25 past now, but we can take a couple more questions um, if that's all right with the speakers. Um, and just to say that uh, captioning will end in about 10 minutes, if that's okay. Um, so um, I've got a question from my colleague Paloma uh, for Laura. I think she'd like to say it out loud, if that's all right. Uh, go for it, Paloma. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. It was very interesting, uh, very nurturing. Um, Laura, I just wanted to ask, I'm also from South America, but uh, I'm going to ask in English uh, for the public, for the audience. I wanted to ask if you, uh, if um, have you had opportunity to interview, to meet some uh, of the women who are involved in the FARC? like they are guerrilleras and how is their own vision about gender? Because gender is something so European in that sense, like uh, epistemologically. And it has been brought to South America in the eighties. So how, uh, how these women cope with this, um, this idea of gender and how they understand this linked to heritage in Colombia? Yeah, so um, I haven't had uh, the chance to interview a lot of women from the FARC, but as part of this project, I did interview uh, Senator Victoria Sandino, who was one of the main uh, persons um, in the negotiation of the peace accord uh, within on the gender lens, and who is now a senator for the FARC, um, for the FARC political party. And so the FARC uh, in terms of gender is interesting because there is a tradition of um, leftist feminism and there's quite a strong tradition of, of insurgent feminism uh, within the FARC, um, which, is, which, which then um, as opposed to what I found in other types of feminisms, uh, and obviously uh, it's difficult to generalize here in terms of uh, rural feminisms or agrarian feminisms, there is quite a strong um, understanding and awareness uh, about issues of gendered violence. Um, and it's taken a quite a, a, a strong feminist, uh, insurgent feminist stance when it comes to these issues. Um, what else can I say about the, the, the FARC and, and, and that? So I, I do think that the FARC uh, uh, woman, and there's, uh, if, if you're not aware, there's a whole uh, organization website called Mujer Fariana, yeah. where they post about their ideas and everything. And um, they have been quite instrumental in contributing to ideas of heritage and gender and uh, forms of feminism in the post-accord period and, uh, and have been in conversation with other forms of women's movements um, and so on because of this kind of insurgent progressive ideas of feminism as well. So, uh, and there is conversations again more within this kind of grassroots organizing. Thank you. And thanks for that response and thank you Paloma for presenting that question. Um, one final question in the Q&A is from Buzna again, um, uh, for everyone I think. Um, uh, it says, um, this one is related to Brown's questions, uh, 
which we had previously. Um, it is almost by rule that heritage practices based on decolonial, queer, pluriversal epistemologies are parts of counterculture, sub subaltern groups, non-institutional actors. What kinds of consequences can this, this can this have on world heritage practice that is usually on the opposite side of these approaches? How do you see the chances of these world heritage practices being transformed? Big question. Anyone has a response? It's, oh, it's quite a, a big one as well, so. <laughs> Any responses? Maybe if I can just say, or Laura, you wanted to, to speak. Um, so it's extremely hard to generalize. And in terms of, of the consequences, I think that the risk is that museums are giving a such high symbolic importance in terms of like being the place um, that should have the role and the power to exhibit some cultures, whereas like for this culture, it doesn't have that importance or perhaps museum or heritage spaces have negative um, ideas attached to them. So again, like um, based on the premise that I think that this type of questions could really only be addressed extremely context uh, specific. I think my answer is really general that again, um, I see that practices can be transformed in, in if we are able like to allow platforms for conversation and like really focuses on like how decision making processes are being set up and try to like not have museums or like heritage policies deciding the way forward without actually taking into account the needs, the voices and the experience we're actually um, talking about. So for me, the, like the shift we should have it rather than having a focus on representation and interpretation is like paying more attention to the processes behind this, this process, this, these actions actually, and critically look at how like if and how power is redistributed and with whom towards what end. So again, the topic of listening and try to have this inverted approach that often have you, we can find in museums and heritage policies. Thank you for that. Um, any final comments uh, quickly from Deepak or Laura um, regarding this question or anything in general? Yeah, I just want to add to the uh, to this question in terms of like from the design uh, perspective, in the sense that India has a huge uh, kind of, or South Asia has a huge art and craft sector uh, which, you know, in a way kind of aids design in terms of form aesthetics. But also there are multiple communities um, which practice and, you know, work with material and are kind of competing for a, for a market. Uh, and somehow we don't really talk about museums in terms of the revenue, in terms of, I mean, we talk about the politics, but we, there is also the kind of economics of it, uh, of, of kind of framing a story. And uh, so from the South Asian perspective, I think, you know, being a community media practitioner, I think, I, I feel there's, there's a need for participatory storytelling, where the community is not only coming in to tell its story, but also is in a way able to participate and, you know, kind of, you know, share the kind of idea of economics of, of, its, of, its, of presenting its story. Um, along with the visibility that it gets. So that's something that the design world is, is kind of trying to do or trying to kind of work with, especially with marginalized communities. So that's something I wanted to put out there. Thanks. Uh, Laura? I think I'll leave it there as well. Thanks so much. No worries. Um, great. Well, thank you to our speakers um, and thanks everyone for your questions. Just to say for that final question, it really speaks to uh, webinar four. So do look out for that, um, which we'll talk about in a second. I'm just going to screen share and show the results of the Mentimeter um, uh, and show what you've all been writing. 
So the question was, um, how can we, can you see this? It says, how can we address um, colonial legacies of gender and sexuality in heritage and heritage research? So we're seeing a lot about um, uh, power, um, multiple voices, um, bottom up approach, uh, reflect on terminology, uh, resisting binaries. I think so much of this speaks to um, the sort of common threads between the three speakers, even though this was such a variety of ways that we can look to how uh, look to look at uh, colonial legacies of gender and, and sexuality, but also ways of addressing it. Um, and I hope these uh, presentations really capture that uh, diversity in thoughts um, and in location as well. Um, I'll just stop screen sharing that and just put it onto the presentation. Um, uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, I'd just like to hand it over to um, my colleagues who are um, hosting the other two webinars. Uh, firstly, if we could hear from Tony um, about the next webinar next week. Hi, uh, that was great, brilliant webinar. Um, next week will be on local learning, everyday activism, everyday resistances, what can I do? And so this focuses on the different ways that heritage is erased, appropriated, and exploited and the different strategies that individuals and communities use to resist and resist these systems. Um, we have many speakers and lots of overlapping themes and we'll also be thinking about how uh, people can support these strategies more generally. Thanks. Thanks Tony. Um, can I just say sorry the captioning will stop now. Apologies. Okay. Um, and thanks Lois for that. Um, thanks Tony. Um, can I hear from Merv about webinar four? Hi, uh, thank you all for this interesting webinar and uh, for webinar four, uh, we are talking about institutional inequalities, unequal power relations, uh, which mainly we would like to talk about the structures in World Heritage List uh, created by UNESCO or uh, World Heritage Committee and how these structures interact with local framework, local policies or uh, local community. So uh, we are inviting you all to discuss uh, all these issues with our uh, four speakers from different parts of the world and you are all welcome to join us. Thank you. Thanks Merv. Um, right so thank you everyone and thanks again to our speakers. Um, I really hope this has been an enlightening uh, and uh, interesting uh, talk for everyone. Um, and yeah, uh, I think we can leave it there. Uh, and unless Lois, do you have anything to say? I don't think there is anything to say, but I think um, there will be, okay, great. Um, yeah, there, this will be also available on YouTube eventually as well. So um, yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining and take care. Bye. Bye bye, thank you. Bye, thanks. You're welcome.